This morning, I want you to take these verses into consideration this morning as we see passages of 2 Peter, and really a lot of 2 Peter was written for this cause, and it's summarized as some books of the Bible are in these last two verses. It says in verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before. These were not novice Christians, many of them. He was reminding of them of those things which they had heard even before. And many times we have heard scriptures preached. Perhaps you have heard the word of the Lord preached from a particular passage. And you hear it and you say, okay, I've heard this sermon before. I've heard this this title before. I've read this story before. But be careful because there is a warning given in this passage. I am telling you today, we're seeing a lot of growth in the church at a lot of of different levels. Our young people, it's encouraging to me. My son yesterday, we were driving home from, no, on our way to soul winning yesterday in the morning. He wanted to ride with dad. So we got the boys in one vehicle, the girls in the other. And Jeremiah said on the way to soul winning at 9 a.m. in the morning, he said, dad, just out of the blue. What, what is the gospel? I said, well, the gospel is the good news. The good news. I said, you know what the good news is, right, son? He said that Jesus died for our sins so that we can go to heaven. I said, bingo. That's it. I said, I said what are we doing out here given the gospel? He said, we, want, we don't want people to go to hell. I said, bingo. Right answer. And as I was just quizzing him, and he's six years old, it's good to see that even my six-year-old son is growing through his, through his Sunday school class, through his teaching and learning, through his own studying of the word of God. We have him read, he has to read the smallest chapters. He's quite familiar with Psalm 117, okay? But he just, he's in kindergarten, and some of those words are big for him, but he can read little words, and we help him with the big words. I'm thankful to see growth. We see growth in t- people who are born-again believers taking steps of baptism. How many of you think that's awesome? And I'll tell you, you'll never see growth until you see someone get baptized. Because I don't know what happens. The Holy Spirit just charges them spiritually. And they're ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. And, and boy, isn't that good? Isn't that good? I will caution you. The danger is, the danger of being in a church is that we can settle in. We can slow our growth even to a halt. We lose that desire as a new Christian to grow. Are you with me here today? We slow almost to a crawl and it becomes where we just stagnate. That is the danger. We actually think we have arrived. I'm there. And all our greatest deeds and all of our greatest accomplishments and all of our days of glory are long in the past. Hey, I'm of the mindset that we press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That we forget those things which are behind, Paul said. And I'm still reaching forth unto those things which are before. I'm still of the mindset that in 2023, we should bear much fruit. And it doesn't matter how many discouragements come our way. And it doesn't matter what the news media may say. It doesn't matter what Washington, D.C. may decree. I'm here to tell you today, friend, that we are called to bear much fruit. And we're called to grow. There's a couple steps that we can have for growth because either one of two things is happening. If you are a child of God, you are either slowing your growth or you are growing rapidly. There's really no two ways about it. So let's look at the scriptures because it was given here. It says, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware. Just because you know them, that can even be a trap as well. Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace. Let's say those three words together. But grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's three steps we're going to look at in growth. Number one, there's a caution. Beware. You have to understand this caution to accelerate your growth. You have to see this. And I will caution, no matter if you are a new believer, no matter if you just trusted Christ as your Savior, no matter if you just took a step of baptism, No matter if you've decided I'm going to be baptized soon, no matter if you've been in the pews for many years, no matter if you're uh, an elderly person, you said, Pastor, I've gone to church my entire life. This is a great beware for all of us. Here it is. The possibility of you failing. Letter A, failing. Beware, the Bible says, lest any man fail of the grace of God. 
We have the opportunity in 2023, although I am praying for our growth, I'm praying for our spiritual growth, that we are striving to take steps toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I thank the Lord for growth that I see. However, I'm not naive enough to think that there may be some who fail in 2023. I sure pray that that doesn't happen. But look at what the Bible says. The possibility of failing actually happens in 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to go through 2 Peter a little bit, but we were there in 2 Peter 3. Look at verses 1 and 2 with me. He's going to explain why the second epistle of Peter was written. It says, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds in the way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of the apostles and of the Lord and Savior. We have to be stirred up. Sometimes we just get settled a little bit too much. And that, my friends, is exactly what the devil wants to do. He wants to get us so worried about all the cares of this life that we're not stirred up anymore for the things of Christ. Oh, sure, at, at a time, we were stirred up for Christ. But now, we need some stirring. So that song we sang, did you hear that song? Revive us again. We grew up, I, I, my, mom, my mom's here this morning, and she's, a, she's the avid tea lover. And for some reason, I never took to it. And even sweet tea. Now, you don't like sweet tea? I, I, you know, the flavor is off, all right? There's something wrong with it. Coffee, I don't know. Never took to coffee. You know, I, I enjoy more of the sugary treats like Kool-Aid. Amen? We grew up on Kool-Aid. And I made myself several Kool-Aid jugs back in the day. And you ever have, you put in the sugar and it asks, you know, for... This one quart of Kool-Aid, you need four cups of sugar. You know what I'm talking about? And you get about this much sugar and the liquid in the top, and you try to stir it. And it looks like it's all in the water, and then all of a sudden you wait a little while. and you, If you get the bottom of the Kool-Aid jug, it's a little, little crunchy, a little grainy. So before you ever drink the bottom, you always have to, let's stir that guy up again. I don't know why, but hey, the stirred Kool-Aid always tasted better than the stagnant stuff. Once in a while, God's got to come along to you. And as we ask God, Lord, stir me up. We don't sometimes like the feeling of being stirred up, challenged, said to take that next step. I'll be honest with you. Christians at any age, I think the older you get in the Christian life, I think the danger becomes more prevalent. The desire to stop changing. Okay, Lord. You got me this far. We, we want to look at where we've come from. This is who I used to be, but God's not really interested in who you used to be. God's interested in what he wants to make you. And we're too busy looking back and saying, man, look at, look at how far I've come. And Christ goes, man, we have a long way to go. Let's not park here. Let's not stop here. And that, my friends, is a measure of failing. I marvel there, there are some people that get there and they actually can fall away. Second Peter I'm sorry, Galatians 1, 6 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you in the grace unto another gospel. Here's my worry and my fear, especially with you new, new Christians. You're excited and you're charged and you want to take in all types of teaching. But I'll caution you, most types of teaching are not biblical types of teaching. And just because you've heard a bombastic pre, uh, speaker on a podcast or on YouTube, it does not mean it is the truth of God's word. It may be, it very mel well, well may be, backed by the word of God. And I've found some wonderful messages and sermons. However, I have found some absolute garbage from people that have been one to the Lord. And they go, Pastor, you got to listen to this. And sometimes I even hear that, see the name, and I go, oh, no. This guy, <laughs> he may preach most things good, but boy, he's got some fallacies in his preaching. He's got some danger. And I want to be cautious here because as we grow in the Lord, you may be a little bit too anxious to grow that you take in some bad bait. We had, a, we had a dog growing up, and he was always hyper, running around the neighborhood. And one day we found that he had eaten some poisoned meat. Someone had poisoned the poor guy. He was a little too hyper to eat any meat he could get. Be careful, young Christian, that you're not hungry for every meat you can get. 
Make sure that you understand the words. Look at what it says in 1 Peter 2, 12, 2 Peter 2, 12. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there also shall be false teachers among you. I'm not naive enough to think that through this week, some of you are going to hear some false teaching. Beware is what I'm saying. For they shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord have, brought, have bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Let me just pause for a moment. I am very wary of some new idea. You say, Pastor, you're just an old fuddy-duddy. Okay. You're just of the, one of the old mindset. No, I just don't want to follow somebody who's on the road to destruction because it will be evident very soon. You can't have someone preaching for very long before you see the fruits of their labor. Now, you might not see fruits right away from what tree it is, but as we studied last week, two weeks ago, the difference between a good tree and a bad tree, you will know them by their fruits. And it will be evident through time who is standing by the word of God and who are preaching damnable heresies. I can even tell you, there, just in the, the last 10 years, how many people said, Pastor, you got to listen to this guy. And yeah, it sounded good for a little while until you found out very quickly, yeah, he was thrown in jail, lost his whole ministry, did this illegal stuff, didn't even do anything that he was saying. Those are the kind of people you have to say, wait, time out, be cautious. These are the kind of people, hey, they will, they, will, they will bring upon themselves swift destruction, says there in Scripture. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And, and, they, give, and they give the word of God, and they give Christ. That word Christian is almost a bad term today, isn't it? Because many, the way of truth has been evil spoken of by their pernicious ways, and, by, and it's been evil spoken of. What used to be a godly term, a Christian you say Christian now, it don't even mean anything like what the Bible says a Christian is. Be careful because of failing. Question, and this is maybe for, if you've been in church a while, how many of you can think of someone who has fallen away? How many can think of somebody who used to be in the pews, used to be in the pulpit, used to be serving in the ministries, and maybe they have failed? That's a possibility we all have. I want you to also realize not only the possibility of failing, but the path to failure is found right here. Many times that it's boasted right in front of us. 2 Peter 2 verse 19 says, while, the, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. I didn't get to get to this in my Sunday school hour, which I'll take my time next week and really point to liberty. But I want you to notice that there are people that are teaching liberty in Christ, and it is actually bondage apart from Christ. It is slavery in the world. There is a level, there's a measure of social gospel that is absolutely counter, counter everything to the word of God. It is opposite of the liberty of Christ. According to this passage, they promise their converts freedom but their freedom is soon lawlessness. Grace does not grant permission to live in the flesh. It supplies you the power to live in the Holy Spirit. We see that there is a caution of falling, of failing and then of falling. Now, letter B is of falling. Now, this is not of salvation. This is just, we just get blown away kind of by the devil. Look at what it says in Colossians 2, 7 and 8. Colossians 2, 7 and 8 says, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and through vain deceit, after the traditions of men and after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. So beware, we can all fall. And that has to do with us still growing our roots, getting rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. And then following what the Holy Spirit teaches us, says in 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith and a good conscience, to which some, having put away concerning the faith, have made a shipwreck. Some people, the Holy Spirit was telling them, you got to do this. So they said, nah, I'm not going to do that. And their lives were shortly thereafter a shipwreck. Oh, boy. See, Pastor, can you give some illustrations of some families and lives that are shipwrecks? <laughs> I could hardly find the calm seas that don't have ships that are sunk. What we're having here is people that used to follow the truth. There used to be people 
just like you sitting in pews, just like this, that were saved, follow Lord and believers baptism, on fire for the Lord, and they've fallen away. They litter this county. If none of them had fallen away, I wonder how powerful this country would be through the gospel of Jesus Christ. If every person who was born again, baptized and followed the Lord in baptism, and were in a good local church, if they were still continuing in the things that they were doing, I wonder what kind of country we'd have. I think there's little question, wouldn't you agree? We would not be anything close to what we see today. We would be a bastion and a beacon to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But folks, it's the falling away that the devil's really good at. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 14. But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned. And I don't care who you are, and I don't care how long you've been around, that phrase is for us today. Amen? And if you've been saved a day or a week or a month or a hundred years, that's for you. Continue in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Look at this phrase. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Are you with me? I'm convinced of this. There's a lot of contemporary and neo-evangelical churches that are winning zero people to Christ. You know who's filling their pews? The people who left gospel preaching churches, born again, and they wanted to stop growing and they went to another pew that they didn't have to grow. The gospel preaching churches are filling the dead churches all around this country. You know why? Well, this guy's got a better message. They forgot whom they have, who they learned it from. They forgot who they learned the truth of the gospel from. And those churches are not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're having, they're having people run down the aisles and fall over and faint backwards, and they're whacking them on the heads, and they're healed. But not one person has a saved life or a changed one. You say, where is all this coming from? Well, hey, they're getting filled by the people who are trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and who said, I'm going to stop growing. Because I'm not going to continue in the things I have learned. I want something new and fresh again. Friend, I'm telling you if you, have a, if you have a relationship with the Lord that's right, it can be new and fresh every day. Don't let it stagnate. Don't let it sit so long that you just get bored of it. Oh, church time again? How long does the pastor have to preach? And I'm telling you, you are dead inside if you get tired and sick of the word of God. There is something wrong with you spiritually if you are more interested in getting home and turning on the TV than you are listening to five more minutes of the Word of God. And we need some Holy Spirit, God-sent revival to people sitting in pews that have no desire to be there. Do you remember what it was like? Do you remember when the Word of God burned in within you? Do you remember when the Holy Spirit spoke and you said, Lord, I'll do it? Do you remember the victories you saw in the Christian life? Continue in the things that thou hast heard. Folks, we just, look at a lot of this stuff is not new. It's not novel. And therein lies the problem. We're looking for the new and the novel. We need to get back to say, hey, Holy Spirit, revive me today. I'm just stagnating. I'm getting a little bored of your word. I'm getting a little bored of church. That's a problem of this world. Folks, you can't walk around too long. you got to get back. And the warning here to the believers is, hey, You've been so long in the word of God. Beware. Oh, boy, there's a caution there. Folks, we need to have a clear conscience. We need to be rooted with God. Someone once said this, keep short accounts with God. Amen? Short accounts with God. Back in the day where you used to have to balance a checkbook. And remember those days? You remember, you remember ever waiting until like the end of the month and you got to go back through? Boy, was that a, that was a mess, wasn't it? It'd be better if you read it, wrote it down right away. <laughs> It'd be so much easier. It'd be so much better. Be, have that kind of short account with God. True Christians, true, true born-again believers can never fall from salvation, but they can fall from their own steadfastness. Continue what you have been taught. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but, you see the phrase, ready? Continue in the things that thou hast learned. Because, folks, we're, gonna, we're in an age where there is deception on every single corner. And there may be someone who even claims to preach and teach the word of God that actually teaches exactly opposite of what it's saying. And I'm telling you, I, I can't hardly go a week without seeing believers 
posting things on social media and saying, boy, I'm so excited for the things of God. And they're actually promoting the things of Satan. And it, 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 it literally hurts me. And I don't want to have to say something, but many times I have to say something so that the simple will beware. The person will look at it and go, oh, pastor, yeah, I, 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 was, I, I love that preaching, but my pastor's saying it's wrong. Hey, listen, knowing of whom thou hast learned them is very key. Be careful learning something from someone you have no clue who they are. And that's a danger. Let me give you the number two. So there are three parts to growth. Number one, there's always a caution. Number two. There's a command. Did you catch that imperative statement? Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should be constantly growing. We should not only just grow in little spurts, but in constant experience of development. Look at what it says in 1 Peter 2, uh, 1 Peter 2, uh, 2, verses 1 through 3. It says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile as hypocrisies, and envies and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Did you know that's not talking to just newborn Christians? It's not saying newborn Christians desire the sincere milk of the word. I've heard that preached before. If you're a new baby in Christ, you need the word of God. No, as newborn babes. In fact, your appetite should grow for the word of God not deaden. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And we have some believers that are filled up to a thimbleful because they have a very little hunger and desire. When pastor says, all right, I'm going to preach a little longer a message, we go, oh, I can hear your little gasps. I'm not as deaf as some of you. And I want to preach an extra 45 minutes. Although that's the flesh in me. And by the way, that's the flesh in you for gasping. And we need to get back to saying, hey, have you ever tasted that the Lord is good? That's what the question is. If so be, you have tasted the Lord is gracious. If you've never tasted that, then hey, there's an altar this morning. You can call upon him and you'll find that he's good. And if you have done that, you can remember a time, man, God was good. He didn't stop. You need to get back to loving and desiring as a newborn babe the milk, milk of the word. You ought to be begging God. God, give me another opportunity to have you speak to me and to change me. I'm not, a, I'm not, I haven't arrived yet. How foolish we are as people, are we not? That pride can creep into any stage in any area of life. And to the, by the way, it was Spurgeon who said, it is the easiest place to backslide is from the pulpit. Because we think, I've gotten there, brother. I sure wish all of you would get to my level. Boy, isn't that sick? How wicked. Yeah. How wicked thinking is that? Friend, I don't know about you, but there's a cause greater than just what's happening in the football games today. And I don't know what it is that you got to watch on TV, but brother, it's trash compared to the blessings and the graciousness of our Heavenly Father. Beware. Beware, it says. That's the caution. But then we have a command. Grow. Let me ask you this. What's ruining your appetite for the Word of God? Help me out today. You say, Pastor, I just don't have as much a desire. Well, then something's ruining your appetite. Because the word of God is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I'm telling you, this stuff is good. If you have no desire, there's something ruining your appetite. You better come before the Lord this morning. If you don't know what it is, you better beg him to tell you. Because that stuff is corrupting to you and your household. Let's just get right with God this morning and say, let's lay aside all this nonsense so that I can desire the sincere milk of the word. Someone said this, before we can learn the sufficiency of God's grace, we must first learn the insufficiency of ourselves. Some of us need to get off our high horse and say, boy, I have none of it figured out. Without him, I can do bupkis. That was in the original Greek. <laughs> so we look at this passage. No, letter A, we grow in grace. Look at what the Bible tells us to grow in. Grow in grace. It says grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace 
To grow in grace means to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom we receive all the grace we shall ever need. Grace nurtures and grows us in the word of God, in the love of God, in the person of God, in the church of God. Grace nurtures us. It grows us. It teaches us. 2 Corinthians 12, verse number 7 says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. By the way, if you've been in church a while, you've had an abundance of revelations. Sometimes God brings some stuff into your life before you're exalted above measure so that you don't stagnate. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, Paul said, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might, be, that it might depart from me. And the Lord said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Winston Churchill said this, kites fly the highest against the wind, never with it. And sometimes the Lord is bringing something into our lives so that we grow. God brings a storm because we need to start growing. And if you've experienced one lately, it's time to get off your high horse and just say, well, let's just hang on until the Lord comes back. And how about you grow and have fruit before the Lord comes back? Because that's what Christ has called us to do in 2023, friend, and his word has not changed. One dot. Grace not only nurtures trust in Christ, it also produces praise for God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. See, you don't sing in your heart many times to have grace in the Lord. God's grace should be cultivating that in you. Amen? Again, I'm not a believer in the fake it till you make it stuff. I am a believer in Let's get back a hold of God, and he'll kindle the fire. I said that just a moment ago. Painted fire never burns. It has no heat. And just because you paint on fire on a Sunday morning doesn't mean you don't ha- it does not mean that you have the grace of God. It does not mean God's burning something in your heart. Let's get back to have some good old-fashioned burning where we just yearn. I've seen some new believers come, and they just sit on the edge of their seat, with their Bible in their hand, and they're weeping the word of God. And we got some old dusties that just sit back impress me i don't want to impress you first of all that's not my job what does god's word tell you to do today it's time for you to grow and i'll tell you that new believer that's just hanging on every word is leaps and bounds upon this ahead of this and any one of us can get to that point because it's a danger grow in grace grace produces praise for god god gave you twenty-three thousand breaths every day you're alive How many of those breaths do you use to praise him? Grace produces a heart to give. It says in 2 Corinthians, I have the passage here in verses uh, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 8. It says, Moreover, brethren, we did you to wit that the grace of God bestowed upon the churches in Macedonia, how that in their great trial of affliction, their abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. What that means is this. God's grace was so heavy upon them that through their deep affliction and deep poverty, they gave greatly. Do you know God's grace should be cultivating giving in your spirit and in your life and in your heart? Do you know what? You should be given more to the cause of Christ than you ever have before. And by the way, that's growth. I've said it this way. All growth is measurable. Everyone can see growth. Help me out here today. Yeah, you say, well, God sees the heart. Yep, and we did that in Sunday school, and we'll get to the other half, the other side, but we see the growth. If that tree didn't take one inch higher before last year, it didn't grow. Growth is measured. It's always measured. Yeah, we talk about growing one way now, okay? How many of you stop growing one way? It's not primary growth. It's called secondary growth now, amen? Now we're growing another way. But aren't you? But growth is measured. How would you measure your giving growth? How would you measure? I'm sorry. How would you measure your? And by the way, that's why we have that on the back of the of the chart. You say, Pastor, well, I'm growing in the Lord. I just do none of those things that are on the back. Eh. You have been fooled. You're not growing. You're stagnating. And by the way, that's, that's exactly how churches die all across this land. 
And if I could bring testimony after testimony of people who have been in churches that are dead and dying, it's simply this. There's no growing among the people that are in it. Now, they want people to come in, but they don't want to be growing themselves, and that's a danger. Grow in grace. Let her be grow in knowledge. Do you know we're supposed to be growing in knowledge? How many of you are glad when you finished school that you never had to learn anything ever again? Amen? <laughs> Woo! You said when you threw that cap out into the air, never have to learn again. Praise God. And many of us probably had to learn this lesson. Your learning just began. Right? You couldn't wait to get out of school, and many of you wish you could go back. And they want to get out, and you want to go back. And that's probably the little bit is that you must always be growing in knowledge. What are you learning this week? And I'm not talking about what, what, what you got on, you know, what's that? Pinterest. Oh, I Pinterested a lot of things I want to learn. Okay. I, I, I saved a whole bunch of videos to my YouTube channel. I'm going to watch them this week, you know? You know what I'm saying? Like how to reorganize my, uh, my cabinets for better space, you know? That's great. That's, I'm not saying not learn. You should be growing. You should be learning. I'm talking spiritually. I'm not talking about physically. What are you learning this week, this month, this year? By the way, that's why we have Sunday school classes. Amen. You know, the hypocrite is not the person who shows up to church. The hypocrite's the person who stays away thinking they know it all. Hello, help me out here. I don't need to be there on Sunday nights, Pastor. I think I got it figured out. I say, ouch. Pastor, I don't need to be there on Wednesdays. I've heard the Bible a lot. I say, ouch. Pastor, I don't need to be in a Sunday school class. I'll just show up on Sunday morning because I got one job to do, and I'll do my job. I'll do my two jobs. I have people have to see me and nod. Hey, I got my thing. Ouch. You are the reason churches die. I won't, I won't say that harmfully. I'll say that as kindly as I can. Let's grow. And if you get mad at a pastor or a preacher who's encouraging you, sometimes we need a little exhorting. Amen? Take the step. Let's take the next step. Let's grow in knowledge that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being. There's that word. Fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Folks, you should have a measurable increasing knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You should be growing in your understanding of the word of God daily. Pastor Isaiah, that, does, that sounds boring. Yep, because you have arrived. That's why. Let's come. Hey, let's be increasing in the knowledge of the word of God. And by the way, the church is the soil in which a believer grows. I've heard people, I don't need to grow. I'll stay out of church and I can grow just fine. Hasn't happened yet. Everyone's the exception to the rule, except you can't break God's. Grow in knowledge. How about this? Grow in faith. Grow in faith. The danger in slowing, and by the way, this is, I think this is one of the reasons that we slow in our growth. Are you with me here? We stop walking by faith and always start walking by sight. You know why those young believers are ready to do whatever? If pastor said jump, they would jump twice as, they just, they'd do all the way. If I said, I want you to light yourself on fire, that'll take care of you. I think there's some that would do it. And I hopefully I never start doing that kind of junk. But you know what? They're, they're ready to do whatever it is. If they say, Pastor, I get that. Pastor, whatever you say, that's what I'm going to do. You know what that's called? Faith. You tell me, I obey. That's called childlike faith. Amen? I wish you had some kids that did that. So does God. Here's where we stop growing. We start living by sight. We got over the jump to living by faith, and we go, you know what? Now i got to balance a budget, Pastor. I can't give to God because it doesn't fit in my budget. We stopped growing because we stopped taking steps in faith. God, I don't see how that's going to work, but you know what? I'll do it. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So grow in faith. Let me give you this last one. This last one will be swift, I promise you. There's a caution, number one. We have a command, there's number two. We have a concentration. You know, this all gets fixed when the focus is Jesus Christ. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 
Here's how you grow. You look at him. And you, and you find out very quickly that the Lord Jesus Christ is not who I am. I sure wish that every word I said were the words of Jesus Christ. How many of you wish that? Then we got some growing to do. How many wish that everywhere you went, you were Jesus Christ in the flesh? Because that's what Jesus Christ wants from you. When you woke up, when you went to bed, in all things, you were given glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our concentration. Then we find we've got to walk with him, though. Look at this passage, verse number one. We concentrate on his person. See, if you're focused on all the additional things, let me just give you a quote. This is by A.T. Pearson. I, I love this quote. Listen carefully, because this is my soul. You, you might, this might be the price of admission if you write this down. The supreme test of his service is this. For whom am I doing this? Did you catch that? I've written that down many times. The supreme test of service is this. For whom am I doing this? See, if you're doing it for the pastor, you might not show up. If you're doing it for your spouse, it may be based on emotion or feeling. If you're doing it for people, I'll promise you, people let you down. If you're doing it for that, you'll find it's empty. And you'll find you already have your reward. But if you do it for him, you'll find that there's nothing that can stop you. I don't know why David charged Goliath that day. I don't know what, what exactly all his thinking but I'll bet you it had to do something with this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Do you know who David was focused on that day? Everyone else was focused on a giant. He was focused on the Lord. God will accomplish supernatural things through you if you focus on him. But we get so focused on the natural that we do not concentrate on him, the supernatural. I will tell you this, if you're doing right for your kids, you'll do right as long as your kids are around. Hello? I've seen it. If you're doing right because you have a Sunday school class, you won't do right when you don't have that Sunday school class. Why are you doing what you do? Why are you here this morning? Folks, we've got to get back to saying, I've got to be with my Lord and Savior he is the one who died for me. He is the one who loves me. He is the one who has my pathway planned. Every day, every moment, every second I spend apart from him is a moment or day wasted. I must be with him. That's called growing. You can slice it any way you want. That's growth. That's why the Lord said the greatest command is this. You shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This is the great commandment. Focus on Jesus Christ. That is the number one command. We like to get really deep in all different levels. And folks, focus on him. And then we concentrate on his purpose. Let me quote you a couple passages. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Did you know that God has a definitive purpose for you today? He has a purpose for you being here. He has a purpose for you learning and listening and growing. He's got a purpose. Now, I can't see the fruit. You know, I'm, Miss Jada back there, she told me she ate an orange on the way to church this morning. Did you, Miss Jada? And Miss Jada had a, yeah, I love oranges. Do you know, I don't know, I guarantee you that it was probably not grown in Indiana. Do you know, that tree has no clue who's enjoying the fruit. That tree has no clue where the seed's going to be planted. That tree has no clue what fruit will be produced by its fruit. And sometimes we don't know all the outreaching ends of the purpose God has for us. We can't see the fruit that other people may enjoy through us. But aren't you glad to trust in God and say, Lord, you must have a purpose. All things will work together for God, to them that love God, to them who are the called, according to his purpose. Hey, I don't care 
What is happening in your world apart from God and his purpose in your life? What I'm saying is this. You know what? It doesn't matter much who's in Washington. What matters much is that I concentrate on what God has for me today. It doesn't matter much about what the news said is the next tragedy coming down. I think we focus on that far too much. Far too much. And we're focused on him far too little. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's focus on him. Maybe that's a recommitment that you need to make and some that we need, always need to make continually. Let's bow in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we concentrate on your word today. We concentrate on this supreme test for service. But Heavenly, Heavenly Father, help us to be growing. Ultimately, Lord, that's the main cause, the main purpose, the main takeaway we must have. Are we growing or are we slowing today? And oh, Lord, how much and how often, Lord, I have been slowing for you. And I've enjoyed my times of slowing. And Lord, it's so selfish. It's so self-centered. It's so short-sighted. Lord, you've called me to bear much fruit. For herein is my Father glorified. And then we are truly your disciples. With every head bowed and eye closed, you may say, Pastor Ben, the Holy Spirit spoke to me today. I'll just be as simple as I possibly can be. Are you slowing or are you truly growing? Let's all stand. The organ begins to play. If you have a decision to make for the Lord today, do not hesitate to follow his leadings.